So today I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Caroline Luger, a distinguished figure in the world of chromatin biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology as this year's Steambok lecturer. So Dr. Luger is the Jenny Smalley Carruthers Endowed Chair of Biochemistry and Distinguished Professor in, at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's also Howard Hughes Medical Investigator since 2005. She is a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So Dr. Luger has been recognized with multiple awards and prizes. Most recently, Dr. Luger won the 2023 World Laureate Association Prize in Life Science or Medicine. This prestigious prize recognizes Dr. Luger's deep body of research towards elucidating the structure of the nucleosome at the atomic level and providing the basis for the understanding of gene regulation in epigenetics. Her landmark paper in 1997 for the crystal structure of the nucleosome core particle is the bedrock for many current chromosomal biology research. So without further ado, please join me to give the warmest welcome to Dr. Carolyn Luger for today's lecture. Thank you, CT, for your kind introduction. And thank you for uh, all of you to host me and Thurma Fisher um, to host me here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. And I've had a really terrific day already hearing a lot of interesting science and already striking up a lot of collaborations. So I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. So uh, what I will do today, and, and it might be a little bit of unexpected, is I'll, I'll take you on our, our wild and curious journey through uh, searching for histones in all the wrong places, namely in, uh, in non-eukaryotic organisms. Um, and we've had a lot of fun doing this. Tomorrow will be a little bit more, um, hang on, I'm trying to advance here. Here, tomorrow will be a little more general. And, and, and with your permission, I'm gonna like walk down memory lane a little bit because I'm old now and I feel like I can do that. And we'll talk about, career paths and mentoring, and also some newer research on chromatin maintenance and ATP dependent remodeling factors. So tomorrow will be a lot of the gory history of um, our journey to determine the original structure of the nucleosome by X-ray crystallography. Those of you who don't know, this is an ancient technique that we used um, in, in, in primordial times to determine protein structures. And it really was the only game in town at that time. So before we, uh, jump right in. Let's just do a little bit of eukaryotic DNA organization 101. And, and I think every textbook states that the human genome is very large in its physical uh, complexity and as such it has to be organized um, to allow, uh, to prevent tangles and, and to allow um, regulated DNA uh, replication and repair. And so the way this is done is by forming a complex with an equal mass of protein and together this mass is called chromatin. And at its fundamental level, at its first level is the nucleosome, which is basically just a little hockey puck of four different histone proteins that form an octomer. That octomer then binds 147 base pairs of DNA and like beads on a string, hundreds of thousands of nucleosomes are then arranged and coiled up into probably quite irregular ways uh, to, form, uh, to form chromatin. Now, you don't have to be a structural biologist to, to uh, appreciate that the DNA is quite constrained by wrapping around these little hockey pucks. And, and, and as such, nucleosomes determine the spatial um, uh, temporal access to the genome. And so whether a nucleosome is there or not really has a profound effect on whether an underlying gene can be transcribed or not. Transcription, replication, and DNA repair uh, requires very complex machinery. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, tomorrow. Nucleosomes also maintain genomic stability. They protect against uh, physical damages. And they are the targets of epigenetic control, meaning the post-translational modifications of histones that are so profound regulators of transcriptional activity um, are found on the histones. And invariably, this holds true of all eukaryotes. So every eukaryote in this world has this DNA organization. Uh, the histones themselves are quite convoluted. They're simple uh, folds, histone fold motifs consisting of 
three alpha helices that form obligate heterodimers. And these then deposit on the DNA in a sequential way to form these iconic structures where the DNA is wrapped very tightly in uh, about 1.7 superhelical turns. Um, and, and again, you can see here how the DNA is really uh, different to the Watson Crick B form DNA that we see on metal sculptures in, in, in various institutes. It's quite constrained and not accessible to, um, to transcription factors and other, uh, other machinery. So um, in, in recent years, I've become more and more interested in who provided the chromatin starter kit. Where did the histones come from? Where did this whole machinery come from? And what you would normally do is you would go on the eukaryotic tree of life and you would go to the low-lying branches and figure out what these nucleosomes look like. And the problem with that approach is that histones and the entire machinery are highly conserved across all eukaryotes. And what this means is that uh, the histones and the nucleosomes between Giardia and Roger Federer and yeast are virtually identical. And so there's really not a lot that uh, can be had from structural or sequence comparison. Uh, the entire complexity of the chromatin organization machinery is already present in Giardia. And so what we decided to do is look for histones in all the wrong places and look for histones perhaps in domains of life that might have converged to form the primordial eukaryote. And, and as the uh, current theories go, uh, the, a modern eukaryote was probably generated by archaea swallowing up a bacterium. Um, and then some other magic things happened uh, with, and, and a, a lot of additional donations from probably various viruses that then gave rise to the uh, first eukaryotic ancestor. So, we searched for histones in all domains of life, and today I'll tell you three stories uh, that increase in weirdness. We're starting out with viruses, and we'll then talk about archaea, and finally we'll talk about the weirdest of them all, uh, bacteria. So let's start with the viruses, in particular giant viruses. Giant viruses are a large group, uh, that are, are a group of viruses that have only recently been discovered. They are very, very large. And until recently, they were thought to be bacteria because they actually didn't pass through the filtration test that's usually used to distinguish viruses from bacteria. So they are large, they have large double-stranded genomes, and they're thought to be deep branching in the tree of life. And even more importantly to us, uh, a certain class of these giant viruses, in particularly the Melbourne virus uh, that is shown over there in orange, um, uh, encodes its own histones. This virus is also very, very strange because it replicates exclusively in the cytoplasm rather than using the host's nuclear machinery. So uh, we thought this would be a very interesting area to explore. And I just want to throw out there the last thing, of course, we all need is viruses let alone giant viruses. So these things only infect aquatic microorganisms, in particular amoeba. So we don't have to worry about that part. Okay, so the histones in these giant viruses are actually fused as doublets. They're clearly recognizable as the four core histones, but histone H4 is fused to histone H3, and histone H2B is fused to histone H2A. And overall, um, their sequence homology with their host counterparts is very, very low. So it's quite unlikely that they've originally stolen these histones from the amoeba host. And so um, we decided to make these histones in bacteria um, using the protocols that we've established a long time ago and um, answer a whole bunch of pretty straightforward questions. First, can these doublet histones bind DNA? Can they form nucleosomes? If yes, what kind of properties do these nucleosomes have? So this is firmly into our realm of expertise. Where and how are these assembled? And so for this, to answer this question, we collaborated with uh, the virologist who actually discovered uh, this giant virus. And finally, does the virus need its own histones? And if yes, for what? 
So we happily set out to, to answer these questions, which is right around when the pandemic hit. So things went off to a little bit of a slow start, but we managed to express these histones in E. coli. We managed to refold them and to form nucleosomes. And what you can see here on this native, um, poly, uh, on, on this native polyacrylamide gel is that um, they migrate a lot higher than our canonical Xenopus levis or amoeba histones, meaning that they're structurally quite different. They seem to be a little bit more bloated. When we put them on the atomic force microscope, um, they basically just fall apart. And you can see a lot of destroyed nucleosomes, putative nucleosomes. But when we apply um, the trick that we actually use for cryoyam as well, which is uh, cross-linking for, follow, followed by a gradient, uh, we can get particles that look a lot more defined on the atomic force microscope. And in particular, the height profile of these particles is very similar to that of our canonical control nucleosomes. So we were pretty confident that these nucleosomes were um, actually um, reasonable particles. And um, we uh, managed to put them on cryo M grids with a, lot of, um, with a lot of trial and error because they were really quite unstable. We had to cross-link. We used two different DNA sequence lengths to put them, uh, to assemble them, and we determined the structure of both of them to intermediate resolution, but that was sufficient to actually see what was going on. And so what you can clearly see is that they have the characteristic nucleosome shape. So they're very similar to eukaryotic uh, nucleosomes, except for that the DNA ends are splayed open a little more. And this really explains the gel electrophoresis pattern that we've observed. They just have a larger hydrodynamic radius and they're just a little bit more floppy overall. Um, in what, what you can see here is, um, uh, an overall view, and I want to point out what is really different about these histones, and that is the way the, the connectors between the histones. Remember, H4 is linked to H3 through this linker that I'm showing in blue here that kind of weasels its way between the DNA gyres, so that's really different to what we know. And then second, the H4 tail actually latches over um, an, an alpha helix, as you can see here in green, latches over its own alpha helix to stabilize the histone dimer rather than waving out in the breeze and serving as a, temp, as a, as a target for post-translational modification. So uh, we see that these nucleosomes are destabilized, the connectors and tails have structural functions rather than serving as the targets of post-translational modifications. Overall, when you look at the charge representation, they have fewer positive charges. Uh, they still have this acidic patch that we've identified about 100 years ago in human, in all other nucleosomes, this bright red patch up there, which virtually every protein that wants to interact with nucleosomes uh, interacts with this acidic patch. And so viral nucleosomes also has this, have this patch, it's, it's, although it's a little bit differently charged. And uh, we think that really affects the way these nucleosomes interact with each other. All right, so we have a structure. It looks like a nucleosome. It smells like a nucleosome. Uh, does it really form nucleosomes in the virus? Uh, when you do mass spectrometry of the virus, assembled virus, you can see that these viral histones are very, very highly expressed, amongst the most highly expressed proteins in the entire viral genome, you can see they're, they're even higher than the major capsid proteins. And if you do some fancy back of the envelope math, you can um, calculate that there's enough histones to cover the entire viral genomes in, in nucleosomes in a very tight manner. And um, it was very gratifying to see a, a paper by Steve Hennikoff's lab um, about a year later, showing that the gi giant virus genome is densely packed by stable nucleosomes within virions. And this is not structural analysis, but uh, mapping of the viral assembled DNA. And so very close packing of these viral nucleosomes. So are these histones essential? Uh, in order to answer this question, we have to think about the infection cycle. Uh, and I won't show you any data. I'll just show you the schematics here. So this whole thing starts by the virus infecting a nice fat amoeba cell. It goes in, it quickly establishes a viral factory in the cytoplasm. The histones uh, and the early genes are expressed, but histones rather than going into the nucleus uh, 
go back into the viral factory where they're quickly assembled, we think, into nucleosomes. And we've shown this by GFP um, tagged, by using GFP tagged histones, it's that you can look that up in the paper. I'm not showing you the details. Uh, but somehow these histones know how to, how to stay out of the nucleus and not assemble on the amoeba DNA, which there's plenty of. You go back to the viral factory, we have nucleosome assembly, the virus capsid is assembled. We don't quite know what the order of events is here. The amoeba dies a horrible death. The virus is released and then goes and infects new viruses. So um, Chantal Avershell's lab, and in particular Hugo Bithio, uh -huh. decided to generate a knockout virus to investigate whether these histones are actually essential. And what he found is that a virus without H4, H3 um, the virus particles assemble. We don't think they have any DNA in them, but we're not sure yet. And they're um, rapidly outcompeted by wild type viruses. They're not infectious. So clearly this virus needs the histone for infectivity and, and, and for um, virulence. When we complement with transiently transfected viral histones, we get assembly of infectious virus and the mutant virus persists. And so this is the proof that really it is the viral histones that are necessary for virulence. Now, um, what I've shown you so far is that these virus-encoded histones um, are form nucleosomes with distinct features. To our knowledge, this is really the first um, for any virus. And um, it was shown almost concurrently uh, that our structure was, was um, confirmed by another lab uh, using cryoEM as well. These histones localize to the viral factory, and they are abundant in the virus, and they're required for, his, for viral fitness and infectivity. Why and where, we have no idea, and we're having a lot of fun with the Abergel lab trying to figure that out. Now, on a grander scale, it, I believe this is really a fascinating system to study chromatin. We can answer a lot of questions using these systems. How do histones structure DNA in the virus? How, when, and when are they assembled or disassembled? Uh, does it, does, do, uh, do they get assembled in the viral capsid and then packaged? Does the packaging into nucleosome happen in the viral capsid? We don't really know. Um, are there specific assembly factors that the virus encodes? And I want to remind people that about 60% of the viral genome is actually dark, meaning we have no idea what, gene, what these genes do. So there are unknown reading frames. And finally, how widespread and diverse are histones in giant viruses and where did they come from? So we've made progress in, um, to this last question because um, there's actually now uh, a lot of efforts to look at permafrost um, and metagenome analysis have unearthed a lot of new species of giant viruses. So there's a lot of meta metagenomic analysis, but there's actually also a real virus. And, that's been discovered that seems to be quite ancient, and that is Medusa virus. Medusa virus also infects amoeba. It turns them into stone, hence the name. It, it forces them to insist themselves in, in a process that's really not quite clear, but it's a very intriguing name. This virus has four separate histones. They have very unusual tails, um, only again about 20% identical. Um, it also encodes a linker histone. We think that linker histone H1 was stolen from the amoeba host uh, based on sequence analysis. Evolutionarily, this virus predates Marseille virus and the histone sequences are very deep branching. And I don't mean you to read any of this, but I just want you to look at the little yellow dots. These are the human histones in the branching and these red ones are the Medusa virus histone. So you see the very, very deep branching. And so we're thinking maybe this gives us some clue to the evolutionary origin of nucleosomes. The idea is that Medusa virus has, did exchange genes with Leka and then uh, was actually the precursor of other giant viruses. That is one theory that's out there. It's very hard. Uh, I, it's really not my area of expertise. So it's very hard to ascertain whether this is really true. But nevertheless, we solved uh, cryo structures of this, um, of this viral nucleosome. And again, 
it looks like a nucleosome. The resolution is pretty decent this time around. We're getting better at this. Um, and uh, the overall features are very similar to a canonical nucleosome. There are some differences that probably uh, chromatin nerds could get excited about. I'll spare you the gory details. But I will say uh, one really interesting tidbit is this very long H3 C-terminal tail um, that Medusa virus has. And this C-terminal, no, no other histone has a long C-terminal tail. This particular tail lies across the alpha helix, the same alpha helix that is also covered in Melbourne virus by the H4 tail. So there's something about this region that these viruses seem to want to cover with one tail or the other. And we really don't understand why this is the case, but the similarities are really quite striking. All right, so we're having a lot of fun with these giant viruses, um, and there's plenty more where this one came from. Uh, the hard part about these systems, of course, is the biology. These are not your grandma's viruses. Uh, use the the um, methods to genetically manipulate them, to cultivate them, uh, to, to do any science with them are not established. Melbourne virus, for example, is about as stable as Fort Knox. It's almost impossible to break that capsid open. Uh, and believe me, we've tried. Uh, so, so there's a lot of interesting biology and biochemistry to be had, but it's not trivial and it's not proceeding at a very rapid pace, but it's still a lot of fun. But Let's move on to our next organism. So while the provenance of the viral histones is really not established, we don't really know who gave what to whom. Was it eukaryotes to viruses or the other way around? It's actually pretty clearly established that archaea might have had the precursor of eukaryotic histones. The majority of all archaea have one single minimalist histones. Sometimes they have more, but if they have more, they're very, very similar isoforms. So they're not very clearly, they're not recognizable as H3, H4, or H2A or H2B. They're just archaeal histones. They don't have any tails. They just have the three alpha helices connected by short loops. So a while ago, Francesca Martiroli in my lab determined the crystal structure of these archaeal histones bound to DNA. And uh, they look like nucleosomes, very, very similar. Here we have just a single histone. So this is kind of intriguing. And these guys just keep going on and on. Rather than forming defined particles, they form endless hypernucleosomes. They just keep going. And the reason for this is um, that these are built from homodimers. And so there's no reason for them to stop. They can just keep going endlessly. So this is really interesting and, and, and very weird um, and fun, but of course, the question is, this is a crystal lattice. And you can see here, if you zoom in, we built these structures in the crystal lattice from 90 base pairs of DNA. And so you get end-to-end -end contacts in the crystal lattice to form these hypernucleosomes. So the question is, do they exist in solution or even in the cell? What's up with that? So uh, Sam Bauerman in my lab um, decided to assemble these histones on longer DNA, 207 base pair DNA. This was supposed to be his cryo-EM learning project, so clearly not that great yet. Um, he was actually going to work on chromatin remodelers, um, solve the structure, move to industry. That's the end of the story. But uh, what he found was actually very, very interesting. He found that the majority of the particle formed these nucleosome-like structures with maybe some extensions, but then he also found these things that looked like open books. They flop open. And indeed, these archaeal nucleosomes seem to flex and open stochastically, like open up and then close. And he showed this by simulations as well. And um, when he first showed me this, I said, like, no way, like the DNA cannot be this distorted. The resolution of these structures wasn't very good. But you can actually build DNA into these structures, as you can see here, um, that is surprisingly undeformed. It actually looks like deformed DNA. So these things just swing open naturally and then can close down again without any major contortions. So this was a big surprise. And we believe that, um, we believe that um, in the cell, this really beautifully explains um, biochemistry that we've done with archaeal chromatin. So, or, uh, so 
opening up this organism and uh, analyzing the chromatin using micrococcal nuclease digestion, we get a very regular 30 base pair pattern, which is very different from the um, 150 base pair digestion pattern that we get from eukaryotic nucleosome. And we think that this stochastic opening and closing of these particles really uh, beautifully explains that. So you have micrococcal nuclease that can um, stochastically grab between the histones and cut it between the histones to result in the sturdy base pair uh, pattern. So, um, so we think this, is, uh, this, this really provides a low tech way to permit access to the genome. Archaea, as far as we know, have no ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers. They don't have any of the elaborate machinery that eukaryotes had to evolve to deal with nucleosomes. And so we believe this kind of inherent floppiness just provides windows of opportunity to, uh, to allow gene regulation. We've shown through mutagenesis that these hypernucleosomes contribute profoundly to gene regulation. So if you introduce a mutation that remain, that keeps the DNA binding intact, but prevents the stacking, prevents, so we put a mutation to kind of drive a wedge into here. Um, these, these organisms are viable, but they have a very, very hard time to adjust to changes in uh, food source. And so they really cannot adjust to changes in carbon source, for example, meaning that their transcriptional profile um, that the, the transcriptional regulation is really messed up. Now, one thing that I found uh, very intriguing is that um, a while after we published our structure, Daniela Rode and Rhodes and Lars Nordenskjöld and their team um, showed in eukaryotes that uh, hypernucleosomes can also form at eukaryotic telomeres. So this is really weird. Telomeres have very, very short repeat lengths, and that's been known for a while, and it's been very untractable what the chromatin structure looks like. These teams have managed to determine the structure of um, telomeric nucleosomes, and here is the comparison. To the right is the eukaryotic telomeric nucleosome structure, and intriguingly, they found that these structures can exist in an open state, Two nucleosomes kind of linked together with literally without a linker DNA, but they can also sit on top of each other in the closed state. So if you remove the DNA, uh, the, the protein just for ease, and you superimpose the two, ta-da, it's pretty striking. So to me, this is really provides a very intriguing evolutionary link between archaeal and eukaryotic chromatin and, and, and quite surprising, really. Now, um, Back to uh, archaea, lots of questions. Archaea are extremely diverse. There's so many of them. Every day there's new sequences that are being discovered. They live in very, very extreme and diverse ecological niches. And archaeal histone sequences, unlike the eukaryotic histone sequences, are highly divergent. And so there's a lot of fun to be had. And Sean Larson in my lab during the pandemic where there was nothing else to do, um, he, he basically did a deep dive into the sequences. And he's discovered that depending on where archaea live, they use different histone strategies. So if you're a thermophile, you have a specific set of histones. If you're a halophile, you use a different set of histones combined with other proteins. Um, and we're, we're now busy looking at nucleosomes or hypernucleosomes from all kinds of different uh, organisms from different environments. Again, coming with a lot of challenges because a lot of these things are actually metagenomes. A lot of these organisms grow in deep vents or they grow at sulfuric acid. Uh, and so they're challenging to grow, uh, but we're making progress in finding good model organisms uh, to work with. Particularly challenging is, for example, the halophiles because they live at four and a half molar sodium chloride. And it's very hard to do protein DNA binding gels at four molar salt. So everything's kind of reversed. And so we're, we're almost like in the upside down world. <laughs> Everything is like reversed. But, but back, to, back to my original question. So we have a situation here where archaea almost invariably have single no frills histones, no tails, no post-translational modifications, no epigenetics. 
They are same as stable. They form this slinky-like assembly, slows down the polymerase, but doesn't completely inhibit it, inhibit it and they're self-assembling. And then um, as we are expanding our genome, uh, we're, we're, we're duplicating our histones, do now have four core histones. We also have histone variants. We have, this, we have now the ability to form discrete stable building block, uh, particles from two different building blocks. So no more of this super helical nonsense. And the price we pay for these more stable particles is that we now need uh, massively complicated machinery to make the DNA accessible again. So we really package it for good. Now we need machinery to pry off the dead cold hands of the histones. And we require histone chaperones for assembly. And so we'll talk a little bit more uh, about this tomorrow uh, because tomorrow we'll leave the weird uh, world of, of non-eukaryotes and go back to what is more familiar to us. We still don't know what the missing link is. Okay, well, we're really not that much further. So then enter Sean Larson and bacteria. And um, indeed, um, what Sean found is that bacteria have histones. During the pandemic, um, our collaborators, Antoine Hocher and Tobias Warnecke in the UK, again, with nothing much else to do, sat in front of their computer, did a deep dive in, in uh, sequence space of bacteria. And they found that in this abridged cladogram of bacteria, a lot of bacteria, actually a surprising number, encode histone-like proteins. Okay, so these little black bars are putative histone fold proteins. And about 2% of all bacterial genomes that were looked at have histones. Um, and, and they're quite pervasive in some clades in particular. Well, what struck our attention was this class here of Dello Vibrionata. Okay, these guys are super interesting and very, very strange. This little guy up there is Abdella vibrius, and it attacks, it eats other bacteria. It burrows itself into bacteria and digests them in a very nefarious way. So it has a very cool life cycle. It has a small genome, uh, about the same as E. coli. It's only one-tenth of the size. It exists in a free swimming attack phase. It's actually one of the fastest swimmers there is. It has an incredibly strong flagellum. Um, it then finds itself a juicy bacterium. It buries itself into the periplasm where it is protected from other predators and, and, and other influences. So it just lives in there. It secretes a lot of lipases, DNases, proteases into the prey. Basically, the prey gets digested, the nutrients leak out, and it uses those for non-binary uh, division. And this thing has a highly expressed histone. So I'd be really remiss if I didn't show you this video from the Lalu lab. So this is a prey. This big fat thing is the prey. And this thing here is a Della Vibrio that's ready to eat it. So watch what's happening. I hope it plays. Okay. Is it playing? Yeah. Very cool. So now it multiplies, it multiplies. And boom, the whole thing explodes. Very fun. <laughs> All right, so this whole process takes about three hours. It's very, very efficient. This thing has the same genome size as E. coli. It makes about five-ish or so um, um, progeny from infecting one E. coli, meaning that it makes one hell of a lot of um, nucleotides and building blocks from the nitrogen sources in this poor prey bacterium. Because of this devastating effect it has on this poor E. coli, uh, there, is, there is efforts to use this thing as a last resort antibiotic, which I find a little creepy, but you know, um, there, there are a lot of resistant, really nasty bacterial infections, and this might be one way to go about it. It's kind of a niche application. Now, nevertheless, this thing has a highly expressed histone-like uh, protein. It's about 20% identical to archaeal and human histones and it's chromosome associated. So here is the abundant abundance. So it, it definitely qualifies as a nucleoid organizing protein. Sean managed to determine the crystal structure of this. And again, crystallography, this is this ancient technique that we use for tiny, tiny proteins that we cannot do by cryo EM yet. And it's actually when it works super easy and fast. So this is my little pitch for crystallography. 
Also, my second pitch for crystallography, the only reason cryo-EM is so successful is because the PDB is chock full of structures determined by crystallography. Yes, okay, good, I've done my thing. Okay, you can, you can read this thing and you can actually play with the PDB if you were so inclined. So this is the histone. Um, it's, like I said, about 20% identical. It, it has a couple of differences. And, and for example, the alpha two helix, the long helix is about one turn shorter. And the alpha three helix, this guy here is largely disordered. But just like a good histone should, it has a very nice positively charged DNA binding ridge. So up there is the archaeal histone. Down here is the Della Vibrio histone. Um, looks very nice for the DNA to bind on, which is what it does in the archaeal histone. Okay, so we thought, okay, this looks like a histone and it quacks like a histone. So I'm sure it must be binding DNA like a histone. Much to our surprise, it does not. It binds DNA end on. The DNA just keeps on a straight path, refuses to curve the DNA, wrap the DNA around this nice DNA binding surface, despite the fact that it's perfectly respectable and just there for the taking. This was unexpected. And so we decided to um, do a little bit more digging and show that this is also the case in solution. So Sean devised a really elegant experiment um, based on fluorescence resonance energy transfer, where he took 147 base pair DNA fragment labeled with a donor on one end and then an acceptor on the other end. And then when the DNA wraps around the histone, you'll get FRET. And this is exactly what happens for the archaeal hypernucleosome, as you can clearly see in this green line. It does not happen for our bacterial histone. The bacterial histone just does not induce FRET, indicating that the DNA remains straight. And even more fun, in the crystal lattice, the DNA uh, the, the histone actually coats the DNA so that every single phosphate is covered. And so rather than wrapping the DNA around its outside, it wraps itself around the DNA, leaving it straight. Every phosphate is contacted by histone here. I just colored them in the histone colors. And I think you can appreciate in this movie how little accessibility there is for anybody to get access to the DNA. So this DNA is completely encased with a histone protein. Very fun. The DNA binding surface that I keep talking to you about is actually used for protein-protein interactions. And there's a perfectly good other DNA binding interface on the other side. And this one is not used at all in the crystal lattice. But you could argue that it could use it to bind a second piece of DNA forming oligomerization patterns. All right, so these, this, uh, nuclear histone filament remains stable in silico. So uh, Sean likes to do MD. And so he just likes to wiggle things around. And so it doesn't fall apart at all. Um, and uh, this is a trace. We don't need to look at that. But when he pretends, when he just forces it to, to bind like the archaeal histone, right? You can do that on the computer. Watch what happens. It completely falls apart, right? Just blows apart, boom. So this structure is not stable in silico either. And so this again gives uh, more credibility to what we have observed in the crystal lattice. So we have a case here where we have an, a, a reverse, hist we, we reverse histone logic. The bac in bacteria, the DNA is on the inside, the histones on the outside, and this is really flies in the face of everything that we generally know about histones. So that's fun. Um, why does it do that? And can we make it can we reverse this? Hang on. So there's a couple of differences um, between, as I pointed out, between archaeal histones and this bacterial thing. One is the alpha helix is a little bit long, shorter. The other is that there are some interactions between the N-terminal tail. And then uh, it might also be that it is unable to form a tetramer because if you take a close look at all the histones we know, we think the minimal unit for binding DNA is a tetramer through this four helix bundle structure here. So if you analyze the amino acids that form this four helix bundle structure in archaeal histones, in human histones, in worm histones, whatever, um, it, it's always able to form a tetramer, but not so 
in bacterial histones. The amino acids just aren't there. There's the, the third alpha helix doesn't work. So can we restore this tetramerization interface? And um, when we do uh, alpha fold of these mutated histones, we can actually see that alpha fold does not want to fold this thing as a tetramer at all. And it kind of does this weird back to back organization, which really would clash with the DNA in this binding form. So wild type bacterial histones does not form a four helix bundle in alpha fold, but it forms a pretty good one. Um, when we mutate these amino acids, it forms something that looks very similar to what we observe in the archaea. So this is alpha fold. We don't believe anything that alpha fold says because we're real structural biologists, right? So <laughs> we'll, I mean, seriously. Um, we <laughs> so we do a, we make the mutations in the test tube. We do our FRET experiment, and it is very gratifying because here you can see again our 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 kale control in green. Beautiful FRET wraps the DNA. It's all good. Our wild type bacterial histone doesn't do anything. We mutate. Um, the, the N-terminal tail, nothing happens. We, mute, we make the alpha-2 helix a little longer. This was all Sean's idea. I, I was actually certain it would be the four helix bundle. And indeed, I was right. So that's why I'm the PI. And <laughs> actually, that's not true. Mostly, he's right. But, uh, but when we restore this tetramerization interface, we then force these things to bind in the way uh, that archaeal histone spine. So this was really um, very gratifying um, to see. It's not the greatest structure, but now what we're really interested in see in, in, in checking is whether we put these histones, these mutated histones back in the, uh, in the bacterium, what happens? Can they complement? Okay, I'm almost done, so I don't wanna go over. Let me see. Oh yeah, sorry, this is a little slow. Okay, so does this structure exist in the cell? We've teamed up with the Socket Lab, who are basically um, the, the uh, pioneers in Della Vibrio uh, research. Uh, they've done a lot of work on this, and we've um, made uh, citrine tagged histone. We put it into the, uh, into the cell, and you can see that it is actually expressed uh, and stays in the Della Vibrio nucleate associated with the DNA in all stages of this nefarious life cycle. And finally, um, uh, Sean likes to do different things. Uh, and so he's also tried to do some tomography. And this is basically just to show that we can do tomography. We really wanted to see this nucleoid in the cell, but um, we couldn't really, uh, hang on, there should be more, sorry. Okay, here. So now he's segmenting it out, uh, we can see ribosomes and all that good stuff. But the, but the point, so, so we cannot see these structures yet because I think we're not quite good enough yet. So maybe we should team up with Liz and her team. But I will say that other people have actually tried this before and they claim they see these intertwined structures that they claim is a nucleoid. And intriguingly, the spacing of these structures is, is, is exactly the same as of the crystal lattice that we observe. And so it's kind of intriguing to speculate that we see some similar crystalline lattice um, in, in the cell, at least during certain um, aspects of its life cycle. Why, does, why do we do this? Why does this particular bacterium need this? Um, it's, it's been shown by others that the bacterial nucleoid is completely inaccessible during the attack phase. So as this guy swims around with lightning speed, finding something to eat, it doesn't do much of anything. It doesn't do transcription, it doesn't make protein. So it's genome is quite compacted, probably to, to protect itself from viruses and other, um, and other infectious agents. Um, we think that because the overall volume is about 20 times smaller than that of E. coli, and because um, the genome is about the same size, it requires a lot more compaction than E. coli. Um, and uh, could be that during the growth phase, while it's sitting in the periplasm here, it's actually secreting a lot of nasty DNases into the prey to eat it. And it does not want to be eaten itself. And so maybe it needs it during that phase to protect its own little genome from its own enzymes. So that could be a possibility. 
And maybe because it undergoes non-binary deficient, depending on how fat that bacterium was, how much progeny it can get out of it, it just maybe arranges its genome after replication in, in one long sausage link and then just chops it up. And so maybe this genome, this type of genome organization is required to stretch out the genome to kind of partition it out. All those are kind of ideas that are really um, quite half-baked, but, um, but ready for investigation. Okay, so we're still interested in in situ nucleate structures. Uh, we we want to know what is the accessibility uh, doing attack and chip seek. Um, this is complicated by the fact that this thing has a, a real life cycle where it does different things at different stages in its life. Um, and we also are interested in there's a lot of other bacteria that seem to have histones that all look kind of the same. They all have this shortened. Um, this shortened alpha-2 helix, they might or might not be able to form tetramers. So we're having a lot of fun poking around there. Why is this important? I mean, it's like my shout out for basic re research. It really isn't, but uh, we don't know until we've poked around. People who worked on making their yogurt cultures more resistant to bacteriophages didn't really know they would discover CRISPR. And so I think you really need to poke around in unexpected places to find unexpected things. And, and, and uh, as a nucleosome person, I just find it fun to, to, to generate this paradigm shift of our perception of histones as DNA organizing agents. So uh, we've populated the entire tree of life, we think, with histones, although sporadically, there's still a lot more to be done. And I just want to acknowledge people in my lab who did this lab, did this work. Um, this was a collaboration with Chantal Abergel and Toby Warnecke, um, Toby Warnecke lab, and current people in particular, Pam Dyer, Sean Larson, and Chelsea Toner, who, who were majorly involved in this. And we're clearly the coolest lab uh, on campus, at least, because we have our own t-shirts with a nucleus on. So um, uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and hear suggestions about other weird critters you might know about that have histones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn, for this beautiful talk. So um, questions from the trainees first, students and postdocs and undergraduates. Um, I was curious, uh, how do the, uh, are they viral uh, histones post-translation modified? And how do like the bacterial ones uh, compare in terms of like with the eukaryotic uh, histones in terms of post-translational modifications? So for the viral histones, uh, we don't know. Uh, we are, we've just generated antibodies to pull them out from, from the viral factory and from the virus if we can open the virus uh, to test that. So that's still a very open question. Uh, we think not, at least in Melbourne virus, because they're kind of doing other things. Uh, in the bacteria, there really aren't any tails. And so we also think not. That's not to say that there isn't like a, the odd uh, acetyl group that makes it onto a lysine, but we don't think it's used as a regulatory uh, means. In Archaea, people have really looked very, very hard and have not found anything significant. So this seems to be a very recent, recent acquisition in our, in our life uh, as we transition to being eukaryotes. Awesome talk. Um, so you said that you're kind of doing some poking around with all of this viral um, or the system work. Have you did any poking around with the Melbourne, Melbourne viral um, histones so that they could like go into the nucleus of the amoeba and kind of stay there. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's something I'd really love to do. So you would have to put a nuclear localization sequence onto those because that's the only way they could get in. We don't really know whether that's workable. Um, it sounds like an easy experiment to do. It's just genetically engineered and like put it and but these things are very hard to engineer. And so Chantal, our collaborator, they, it's actually not their main project. So we have to kind of push them to do these things. Uh, but I will say what we have started to do is we started to fish out the histones to see what is bound to them. Are there any specific assembly factors? And then we can also get at the PTM question. Yeah.
for the bacterial histones, is there any association of genome size or complexity and prevalence of histones in a given clade? Not really, no. Um, it seems to be pretty sporadic. I think in most cases, uh, they've probably stolen them from archaea because there's quite, they, they actually live together in, in, in many spaces. There's quite a lot of horizontal gene transfer. But it seems like they are all shorter than the archaeal histones. And so they all look like the one histone that we work with. But, you know, bacteria are pretty, um, pretty happy to exchange their genetic material. So how does the histone get shorter if it's inheriting the gene from archaea? You know, we don't know. <laughs> it's, I mean, until recently, we didn't even know they had histones, and so we don't really know. We've actually found some that are very similar to, um, to, to our bacterial histone in an unrelated, only remotely related bacterium. That one seems to do the right thing and bend DNA around its outside. So it's, there seems to be quite a lot of variability, but it's also shorter than uh, our archaeal histones. Um, I think my question was sort of related to the most uh, to the previous one of just that mechanism of the bacterial histones of you identified specific uh, amino acids that prevent that tetramerization from occurring. I'm wondering if that was conserved across all bacteria or if there's been outliers that you've noticed across different species, perhaps. Yeah, it's. Great question, and I have a, uh, an undergrad who is actually now uh, exclusively running alpha fold of all bacterial histone genes as tetramers to find out whether which ones can form tetramers and which ones cannot. Uh, because it's, it's not as simple as just looking for that amino acid signature because there's more than one way to make a tetramer. And so far he's found some pretty interesting things, but it's still a little early and he's trying to, uh, to code things, to sort the data better, to, to make a better case. Um, the question is open to the floor. So can you rescue the giant virus uh, mutant that has the, the, the um, knockout with a host uh, histone or another eukaryotic histone? So, um, uh, the short answer is no. The long answer is you would actually have to put in, uh, because there's a lot of host histones already there. We didn't shut those down. Having said that, there's a pretty efficient system to shunt them, shunt them to the nucleus. So you'd have to actually transfect them without the nuclear localization sequence and see whether you can replace them. Excellent experiment. Uh, we're wanting to do this, and I'm hoping it's in the pipeline. All the genetic manipulations of the virus system because of the complexity of the system is done in France. So we kind of have to push them. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them you asked for it. <laughs> Any questions? So for the bacterial system, it seems like the, um, the, the ratio of base pairs per protein is going to be uh, much, much lower than it would be for a system that wraps. And I wonder about the, the stoichiometry of the protein and is there enough protein to coat the whole thing or do you, the whole genome, or do you think it's in domains? Yeah, so it's an excellent um, observation. Uh, in, in Archaea, we have about 30 base pair per histone pair. Here we have about two base pairs per histone pair. So it's pretty insane. We don't think the entire genome is organized in this way. There's a lot of the histone there, but it's not enough to cover the entire genome. And that wouldn't be a good thing either. And it wouldn't really be compaction. So we think it's kind of sporadic. That's what Sean set out to do uh, with the tomography. And uh, it didn't really give us any immediate answers. Um, but we also wanted to chip seek and attack seek, which would tell us all these things. And do you know, are the energetics of dissociation, uh, is it a weaker uh, binding event? Like if you put a double strand DNA translocase, does it readily displace these bacterial histones in a way that it wouldn't be able to for one that's wrapped? So we haven't done that experiment yet, but the binding affinity is very, is very strong. So it binds stronger than the archaeal histones, hmm, okay. like 10 times stronger. 
but it is also very sensitive to salt. Mm -hmm. So under physiological conditions, when you, if you're talking like 150 millimolar ish salt, uh, it might be a different story. It might be quite resistant, uh, but we, we don't, we haven't done that experiment yet. Whether, whether the polymers can just blow them off. Yeah, we don't know. This is kind of related to Jim's question or maybe inspired by it, but if you over twist or under twist the DNA, can the mm. protein still bind? Uh -huh. uh, I, I would think so because it's literally only two base pairs. So you can't over twist it that much to destroy that spacing. Mm -hmm. But it'd be kind of cool. You torque it and then they just pop off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we haven't done that. That's really fun <laughs> experiment. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I want. I want to use it. <laughs> so that there you go. <laughs> I really want to use the Lumix. <laughs> so I love this idea of going to the permafrost to find viruses. And I was wondering, um, is it are these histones just in giant virus? You found a giant virus in the permafrost. Are there other viruses there? What's the, you know, where is this whole field going? It, it seems that they're that they're so far we've only found them in the giant viruses we meaning the field we we, we actually don't go to the permafrost i would like to but we don't uh, but and not all giant viruses have them so that's a little bit of an enigma um, it's possible uh, th there's some select viruses i think pox virus that maybe that uses host histones temporarily to package its genome but these guys are the only ones that encode their own histones. Why it is so like restricted to that, we we don't know. And 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 also like why would they need them? Right? Seems because they, they are pretty streamlined usually. They don't carry around extra baggage. So and clearly we've shown in this one virus they're essential. We have no idea what for they what they need them for. Right, so um, I have one question for you. So you you re you built these phylogenetic tree using sequences, correct? Mm -hmm. Um. So nowadays, you know, with all these alpha four predictions, mm -hmm. you can use like you know, there's this full tree, and you can use structural homology to build that the tree. So have you done that? And maybe comment a little bit on that. So we haven't done that. I, there's other people who do that much better than we do for a living. But like what I said, what we have done is for the histone sequences, we've kind of alpha folded them to see what their oligomeric status might be. That doesn't really answer your question. Right. Okay. So because they, they might have similar similarity in structures, but the sequence might be like 5% or something like that. Especially yeah, such small. Protein. Yeah, no, we, we've actually done that. We've looked in the sequence space, not with alpha fold, but we've looked for length, we look for PI and then for, for helicity. And so we've kind of sort of done that, which gave rise to our hypothesis that uh, depending on where we classified our archaea into thermophilic and halophilic and mesophilic and what kind of histone strategies they might use. It was not done with alpha fold, but I think we'll probably go there because alpha fold is getting better by the minute, right? And faster. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, otherwise, please give a round of applause right, for Dr. Karen Luga. So just a, just a reminder, there's a reception at 4 p.m. It's like two minutes time, so it's just right outside. Um, and a shout out to WAF departmental sponsors and Thermo Fisher for sponsoring this talk. Right. <laughs>